Shalom, holy initiates and holy adepts. This video is a very, very advanced Kabbalistic video uh, dealing with some very profound, um, what I would say are very esoteric, very spiritual, very mystical, uh, holy mysteries um, that generally speaking are not really known or understood by um, the vast majority of Christians and Jews. Now, before I begin, I need to begin uh, an exordium or introduction um, explicating a few points. Uh, specifically, uh, it's requisite that I speak on the Eastern, the, the Near Eastern theosophies. These are theosophies like Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Buddhism, uh, etc. Now, uh, as a prerequisite for this video, I would say that you should go and watch um, the first part of my series on metempsychosis because I think I did a really good job in that video demonstrating and showing how all theosophies around the world are nothing but inferior images of one superior archetypal theosophy. That superior archetypal theosophy is ancient, kosher, voracious, uh, orthodox Judaism, the very original theosophy of Moshe, of our ancient patriarchs, Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov. And this is the superior true archetypal theosophy. Now we need to remember that Abraham had two principal sons, and he also had uh, many, what, we, what I would say really are bastard children with many concubines, okay? Now, the true spiritual superior line passes through his superior son, which is Yitzhak. Okay, Yitzhak was entrusted and fully initiated into the superior archetypal theosophy. We cannot say the same of his other sons. Okay, from Yishmael, who was known as a jackass, descends a very inferior but similar theosophy to uh, to ours. From Yishmael, we have what is known in our gener in, in our generation as Islam. Okay, it's a very very inferior theosophy to our theosophy. Yes, there are many truths. There are a number of abundant truths uh, in Islam that will be found in Islam. But again, it's an inferior image. There are also many falsehoods uh, and many lies, and they don't have the full truth. They just have a, a, a very large portion of the truth, but not the full truth. Okay, now his uh, the, the rest of his bastard children, uh, of his concubines, are what we would call the Near Eastern people, the Chinese, the Indians, the Tibetans, etc. These are all what I would call bastard theosophies. All Grandmaster Kabbalists, the most highly initiated and holiest of saints, will all refer to all of these inferior Eastern theosophies as bastard theosophies. They are inferior theosophies to the one true superior archetypal theosophy. Anytime I see any Western Gentile man, even if they come from Christian or Jewish backgrounds, and we see many of this in this last generation, which is very lamentable, going and searching for higher truths, religion, and spirituality in these Eastern religions, they show and demonstrate their inferiority. And this is what is very, uh, this is what upsets Adonai. This is what upsets Eloha, Alohai. This is what upsets me very greatly is when I see these very ignorant, stupid, jackass Jews and Christians who go to Near Eastern religions to seek the higher truths, to seek Elohim, etc. These are inferior theosophies. They don't know any better. They're very, very ignorant. Okay, because they are sitting on very low states of consciousness and spirituality, they don't know any better. And so they demonstrate their inferiority. And more often than not, I see this with a lot of Jews. There's too many stupid, too many spiritually retarded Jews who always want, are just for whatever reason, so attracted to these Near Eastern theosophies, not understanding that the one true superior theosophy is right in front of them, hidden in plain sight. It's just so lamentable, I can't even express in words how not just upsetting, but lamentable it is. So again, the momentous point to understand here is I'm, as I, I always want to constantly emphasize is that all the theosophies of the world, whether it's Satanism, Luciferianism, Hinduism, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, they're all inferior theosophies to the one true superior theosophy, which is ancient uh, Judaism, uh, which is the original theosophy of Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and Moshe, etc. Okay. Okay, and modern Judaism has somewhat, to a very small degree, has shifted away from this very ancient primordial theosophy, and as well as Christianity. Okay, so we have to go all the way back to the ancients. We have to go all the way back to Moshe and Abraham, and read our most ancient sealed books to get to the full higher truths. 
because because modern Judaism and modern Christianity are also inferior uh, theosophies to this one true kosher orthodox voracious superior archetypal theosophy. Okay, I cannot stress this enough. Okay, I have to say all of this because I'm going to talk. I'm going to expound upon a, on a very very holy mystery in this video that is very much linked with certain spiritual truths that are found in these Near Eastern Theosophies. Again, yes, there are a lot of abundant truths in these Near Eastern Theosophies. They have a lot of truth. They have a very great significant portion of the truth. But again, they don't have the full truth. And they also have mixed in within their Theosophy falsehoods and lies and very unholy and impure rituals and practices that they perform. So why would anyone want to go and study or be initiated into these inferior theosophies is beyond me. You have to be very ignorant, you know, intellectually and spiritually uh, to, be, to, to, to want to be initiated into these uh, Near Eastern theosophies, okay? But as a Grandmaster Kabbalist, as a holy initiate and a holy adept, we also have the advanced understanding that, yes, they, they do these other inferior theosophies, especially the Near Eastern ones, you know, whether it's Islam or Hinduism, yes, they do possess a lot of truths, okay? We know that, okay? And I can definitely uh, give a very long disquisition, write books and videos showing all of the similarities between Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and ancient Judaism. There's a lot of similarities. They're all offspring of, 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 of Abraham, okay? But they're all inferior, okay? So very, very important to understand, very momentous to understand. I cannot put, I cannot put enough great emphasis uh, upon this matter. So with that established, now we, now we may proceed. Now, before I begin the actual disquisition, I want to make a few introductory points on Sefer HaZohar, which is our most ancient uh, esoteric principle text. Now, we need to understand if you've mastered the Zohar, and I have indeed mastered Sefer HaZohar inside and out, um, that 75%, I would say, this is an a very rough approximation, I would say roughly around 75% of the entire text is all about acquainting and teaching the reader everything about the full spheroth or the Godhead and the divine hierarchy. The whole purpose of Sefer HaZohar is to revelate and, and, and teach and illuminate to the reader, to the initiate, the full knowledge of the divine hierarchy the Sferoth and all of the potencies and emanations that are around it. It's it's basically a, f you, when you have, once you have mastered Sefer HaZohar, you will have a full mastery, a full comprehension of the entire divine hierarchy, all the way from the top to the bottom, inside and out. That's the whole point of the text. That's what holy initiation is all about. You need to have a full comprehension of the Godhead, of the divine hierarchy, all of the entire divine hierarchy, from the top to the bottom of the, of the Great Pyramid. And in so doing, when you especially have a very intimate knowledge of the highest levels of the divine hierarchy, which are the Sferoth and the emanations, that's where you can then begin to, to, be, to, to begin to have a very intimate, close relationship with them. And that's where all the power is derived from. Okay? Now, Sefer HaZohar, in addition to, to all of this, also explains the various patriarchs of Israel as divine archetypes. They represent numerous divi divine archetypes. Again, these patriarchs are very polysemous ar archetypes. That's, that's, that's the whole mysticism behind the text, that symbols, every symbol of the holy word is polysemous in nature and in essence. And these patriarchs, these holy saints and figures that predominate the holy word are all represented of numerous divine archetypes as well as their transient states of consciousness. And I'll give you an example. And what I'm explaining here, what I'm teaching here is very esoteric. It's not fully understood by many uh, modern Jewish Kabbalists. In fact, you won't even find many Jew Jewish Kabbalists even know what I'm saying or explain what I'm saying uh, be because again, they're not fully initiated Kabbalists. It's, it's very lamentable to say the least. They're very inferior Kabbalists. They're not true Kabbalists in my eyes. Now, to give an example, let's speak on Abraham, okay? On one level, right, we can say that when we read, you know, certain folios in the Torah regarding, you know, Abraham, certain sections of the life of Abraham would represent certain states of consciousness that Abraham is passing through. So on one level, when you're penetrating the Hebrew text regarding Abraham, Abraham as a figure and his life, you'll have this very profound esoteric understanding that certain aspects of Abraham's life 
um, and I don't want to get too deep in the matter, would represent different states of consciousness. So as an example, the Zohar will say, explaining one aspect of Abraham's life in the Torah as him having, a, a, you know, attained, you know, the sphere of chesed. And then in another uh, aspect of his life, it'll says at this aspect, at this point in his life, he has now reached the level of, say, Malchuth or Shekhinah. These sferot all represent states and levels of consciousness. And this is, on one level, this is what the Torah is all about. It's it's giving you this, this knowledge, this very esoteric mystical knowledge of the patriarchs as divine archetypes, and also, you know, revealing their transient states of consciousness uh, as they evolve and as they change. Okay? And we'll we'll get a little bit more into detail here as we proceed with, with the disquisition at hand. Now, as we begin here, as I will, as I will, I was, I will begin uh, with in baby steps and move on to, to wait your, uh, to, to you know to, to wait your matters. I want to begin with Adam Kadmon because to understand this teaching, we have to we have uh, I have to establish uh, some very basic foundational points as as kabbalistic and as advanced as they may be. Okay, so again, I failed to mention in the beginning, but another prerequisite to this video. Uh, is that uh, you have seen my 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 small series on Adam Kadmon? It's a very advanced Kabbalistic series, giving full knowledge and explication and illumination of Adam Kadmon, what it is, what it represents, etc. Okay, so I'm assuming that you have seen those videos and you have an advanced understanding of a full comprehensive understanding of of what Adam Kadmon is. Now, basically, Adam Kadmon, as you should know, is, is on one level is binary in in, in nature. Okay. On one level, we may say that Adam Kadmon represents the highest ten Sphiroth, the actual Godhead itself. Okay, the highest Godhead, really. But on another level, on a on a on a on a, on a lower level, more relevantly, more often than not, it actually comes to represent the image of the ten Sphiroth, which is Hamashiach. Hamashiach is Adam Karmon. And Mashiach and Adam Karmon, which are just two different titles or names for the same divine entity, are really the firstborn image of the Ten Sferoth. Now, again, the archetype is Ten Sferoth, meaning that the archetype contains ten levels or divisions. I say this through license of language, of holy language. So, Ergo, it logically follows that the image of the archetype must also possess 10 attributes or 10 levels. Okay, we call these levels in the esoteric Kabbalah part which is the which is a Hebrew, which is the Hebrew word uh, for uh, face. It's actually actually has a Greek etymology, but I don't want to get into that. But in Hebrew, it is known as as signifying a face. Okay, this is a face as an aspect, it's a level, we can think of it as an attribute. So Mashiach, and again, this is something that is, again, not properly understood. In fact, I don't even think it's known by practically 99% of Jewish Kabbalists out there. What I'm revealing in, in this channel and in these videos is the most esoteric of holy mysteries of the highest order, all revealed to me by Hamashiach, taught to me by Hamashiach, okay? I am the real deal, as I'm constantly saying, okay? This is very deep, profound, esoteric stuff. This is only meant for holy initiates and holy adepts. I have to constantly uh, repeat this. So, again, Hamashiach, who is the image of the Ten Sferoth, also contains Ten Sferoth. So we have to distinguish between the archetypal Ten Sferoth and what I like to call the imagical Ten Sferoth, okay? So... Critical to understand this, that there are 10 aspects, 10 attributes to Mashiach. And this is a great, this is the great mystery and secret why Mashiach has many titles and names. Because every title and every name of HaMashiach represents a different state or part suf of Mashiach, right? We call, we can call, we, one title is HaMashiach, but he's also known as Metatron. He's also known as Yahu El. And all of these different names, all of these different titles, you know, um, represent these different these different states of Hamashiach. Because Hamashiach, like like all of divinity, is 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 a shapeshifter. These are you know these are shape shifting divine entities. 
And Mashiach, being being Al, being God, really, can has the power to shape shift. You know, he can be in a state of the in, in the state of the highest form of divinity, or he can shape shift into an angel in a lower state of divinity. He can even shape shift into a, a man, which is the lowest form of, of, of a divinity or existence. So again, Mashiach can enter many different types of divine states or, or existential, uh, you know, levels of being. And not only that, but understanding that he is composed of Tansferoth or Partsufim, he can also um, change within these, he can also change, with, you know, within these 10 parts of theme, okay? So it's all very, very mystical to, to explain. We're dealing with very uh, high spiritual uh, language and matters here, okay? But I'm hoping that you can begin to understand what I'm trying to teach and say here and what's going on. So moving on, we also need to understand the Tree of Lives. Now I have here Tree of Lives because in Hebrew it's eight Chaim. And the Hebrew word Chaim is plural. In other words, the word for life in Hebrew is not singular, it is plural, it's kind. So the actual correct little translation is tree of lives, not tree of life. The tree of lives contains many lives. In fact, it contains all of the lives of all of the children and images of Elohim, of which, of which Israel, uh, you know, is a function of. So very critical to understand this because anytime you see tree of life, understand it's a mistranslation. It should really be tree of lives. This is the correct translation. Okay. Has everything to do with the plurality of divine existence and of lives. Okay. Metempsychosis. This is why many Gentile uh, Christians and Jews are very ignorant on, on higher spiritual matters because they think of life as being a singular uh, having a singular connotation. In fact, it has a plural connotation. It's plural. And yes, this has everything to do with metempsychosis and transmigration of souls. Okay? Now, we also need to understand a very great, deep, profound Kabbalistic mystery. Okay? Which, again, I explained in my series on, on Adam Karmon, which is that Adam Karmon, which is Hamashiach, is also the Tree of Life. The Tree of Life is a symbol. It's an occult symbol and figure for Hamashiach for the image of the Ten Sferoth, of the Ten Archetypal Sferoth, okay? And so with that said, with that understanding, if we take it a step further, we should also have the understanding that there are Ten Sferoth to the Tree of Lives. In other words, there are Ten Branches to the Tree of Lives. This is why when you see an, an, a very ancient standard uh, Sephirothic diagram, they will always refer to the diagram as either Adam Karmon or as the tree of lives. Because the most initiated ancient Kabbalist had this very advanced Kabbalistic esoteric understanding that the tree of lives is Adam Karmon, which is Hamashiach. And all of these three, you know, symbols possess tense for oath. Okay? Very critical, very momentous to understand. Okay, now let us proceed to speak on us, us Israelites, okay? We have to understand that there's a great partition, a great distinction between us Yisrael and the Goyim. And again, I've, I have not had the time and space uh, to fully go into this holy, uh, these holy mysteries and matters dealing with this very uh, powerful distinction. But understanding this, we Israel, we are the only nation that can it can be said truly descends was born of ha Elohim, more specifically of hamashiach hamashiach is our father all of israel are the offspring of hamashiach okay it's a very great powerful holy mystery that um, again most christians and most jews just don't properly and fully understand which is very lamentable now, Hamashiach, as I have already established, possesses and contains tense for oath. He is made up of tense for oath, or part sufim. Ergo, again, it logically follows that Adam, that's us, man, is, you know, an Israelite man or a Jew such as myself, we too are composed 
of times Feroth or part Sufim. Okay, now this is when we start to get very esoteric here because now we're now we're going very deep into the holy divine well. Okay, we're starting to descend into matters that again, practically, you know, every Jewish Kabbalist out there just doesn't fully understand. Okay. Now, let us speak on the parts you theme. I've I've spoken briefly on the parts you theme in the Sfiroth and other videos. So if you've seen all of my videos, then you've done well, and you should be following me thus far very smoothly. Now, the highest three Sfiroth are what we would call the Ruach, the Neshama, and the Nefesh. But there are also lower seven Sfiroth, which are linked to these three. Now, when we when you are initiated and you have mastered um, you know, our principal tax and you're very highly initiated. It's you understand it's a very standard uh, basic fact that when we when we study and when we analyze, when we work with the Sfaroth, the ten archetypal Sfaroth, we understand that there is a binary aspect to well, there are actually numerous binary aspects, but there's one core critical binary aspect to the archetypal ten Sfaroth, and that is that there is a division, and again, I say division through license of holy language, between the upper three Sfiroth and the lower seven Sfiroth, okay? And the lower seven Sfiroth are considered inferior to the highest three Sfiroth, okay? Again, I don't have the full time and space and matter for a full disquisition on all of the mechanics, um, you know, behind the Sfiroth. That's what studying and mastering Sefer HaZohar is all about. But essentially, it needs to be understood that there is this core division between the upper three Sfiroth and the lower seven Sfiroth. And that division permeates all of the lower images of this archetypal ten Sfiroth, the lowest image being our, you know, existence. So with us, we have what we would call the highest three Sfiroth, which is the Trinity, the highest Trinity, which is the Ruach, the Neshama, and the Nefesh, and then the lower seven Sfiroth of our spiritual existence, okay? And each uh, sphera is connected uh, to a part soup. So each archetypal sphera of the archetypal ten sphiroth is connected to one of our own part sufim uh, within our existence. Okay, so each each one of our lower seven part sufim has a automatic spiritual connection to the part sufim and the Sfiroth of the Tree of Lives, or Adam Kadmon, okay? And each one of our seven parts of theme, or Sfiroth, represents a state of consciousness or spirituality, okay? Very critical, very momentous to understand. Now, what will follow here is the scriptural proofs of everything that I have taught and set up to this point. Now, if you've read Sefer HaZohar and you've mastered it like I have, then you would understand and know all of this because this is implicitly indicated in that esoteric principle text with many scriptural proofs okay but i'm going to give to here my own scriptural proofs that you won't actually find in any of our core principle esoteric text again this was all divine revelation given to me i'm sharing it here with you and again you need to understand that what i'm going to now share with you again is not found in our core principle esoteric kabbalistic text but again not all holy knowledge and wisdom is found in our core principle text this is the written tradition. The written tradition is considered very esoteric, and it was a rule of thumb that not all of the holy knowledge and wisdom was to be committed to writing, just a portion. So you have to understand that our esoteric written tradition is but a portion of the holy mysteries. The true, uh, the true possession of all the knowledge and wisdom is found in our oral tradition. Everything is done orally. Okay, whether it's whether it's done orally through a divine, uh, you know, divinely that is through holy saints and Mashiach, you know, coming before you and revealing and explaining this to you or being initiated in the very long ancient line of transmission going back to the 70 elders on Mount Sinai. Okay, so very important to understand. So here I'm going to begin with a little introductory, a little introduction into understanding the more esoteric mystical aspects of the Torah, okay? Here we are talking about the different states of consciousness and spirituality that exists within these ancient divine archetypes that we find in the Torah, of which we are images of. Now we read in Sefer Bereshith in chapter 33, verse 18, it states, and Yaakov came to Shalem, a city of Shechem. Now, if you're a Western Gentile who is not fluent in ancient Hebrew, you read this, you read this verse and everything 
behind this verse just goes over your head. You think this, you might think this verse is is nugatory. It's it's vain. It's meaningless. You're not really. What is it, what is it teaching? What are you learning from it? It's who cares what city Jacob comes to again? If if this is your line of reasoning, if this is your line of thinking, you are part of the profane. You are part of the uninitiated. Right? Yeshua HaMashiach said, not one yod, not one kotz shall pass from the Torah until the heavens and the earth pass away. Telling you that the smallest, most minute aspect of the Torah holds the greatest significance and holds the greatest mysteries. But again, you have to be initiated at the highest levels to know and understand all of this. Okay? So what is this verse teaching? What is it saying? Allow me to now introduce to you and show you how how we penetrate the most esoteric and mystical levels of the text. We need to know Hebrew. Now, we need to understand first that all locations in the Torah represent different states of consciousness and spirituality. So when we are reading about these ancient divine archetypes in the Torah, traveling from city to city or from state to state, on an esoteric and mystical level, this all represents the transient states of these divine archetypes. Okay? Now, Shalem is Hebrew for perfection. Okay, so the first part of the verse is saying, and Yaakov came to perfection. You have that understanding. It's, the verse is telling you that Yaakov has reached the highest state of consciousness and spirituality. After all of his holy initiations, in this verse we now learn that Yaakov has now reached a complete state of perfection. Quintessentially, that is what the Torah is telling us here. Now it then states a city of Shechem. Now the Hebrew word for city is ir. Now this is where it gets really interesting. This is why you need to be fluent in ancient Hebrew to fully penetrate the most esoteric levels of the text. The, he the Hebrew word uh, for city, which is ear or are, depending on the ancient Hebrew dialect, comes from the Hebrew root word ur, which signifies arousal or waking up. Ur represents a state of being awoken, of arousal, of stimulation. And Shechem in Hebrew comes from the Hebrew root word Shechem which signifies to rise, as in rising early in the morning. So put it all together now. The verse is telling us that Yaakov has aroused himself, has woken up, has risen his state of consciousness to a state of consciousness and spirituality that is perfection. This is very deep, very profound. These are the keys that I'm giving you to more properly understand the more mystical, esoteric, recondite aspects of the Torah. Now, let us speak of Noah and the Ark. I've already done two videos uh, going into many holy mysteries on the parable of Noah. And here I'm going to reveal another aspect, another level of the narrative of Noah, clearly indicating and, and, and demonstrating how deep how esoteric and just how deep and profound and full of holy mysteries this parable of Noah is. Now, we read that Noah and his family entered the ark. Now, if you've seen my previous two videos on, on the parable of Noah, then you should know that the ark represents the body and that Noah represents the archetypal divine seal. Now, let us analyze his family. Who exactly enters the ark with him? Who are the family members? Well, the Torah tells us that it's his wife, his three sons, and the wives of his three sons. If we do the math, that's a total of seven members. It's very interesting because here we have the scriptural proof for the seven parts sufim which enter the body. Okay, so we have here the ark, which is the body, being composed of seven parts sufim, seven sferoth, seven states or possible levels of consciousness and spirituality. And if we take into account the three instances of birds in the narrative or parable, 
This then brings us to a total of 10 parts of fin, showing us and indicating that indeed the body, that man, Adam, is an image of Adam Karmon or Mashiach. Now, we also read, if we want to go deeper into the parable, in chapter 8, verse 4 of Bereshith, it states, and the ark rested on the seventh month. We know the ark represents the body. It represents the ex it represents Adam, the existence of the Israelite man. Okay? We need to understand that the Hebrew word for month is a code word. I'm always telling you there's many levels to these Hebrew words. They're all symbols that are very polysemous in essence. The Hebrew word month on one esoteric level may signify a part suf, a, a sphera. Okay, a state of consciousness or spirituality. So what the verse in here is telling us is that the body is, at this point, the body has reached a state where it is now resting in, in the highest part suf, which is the seventh part suf or sphera. We've reached a point where now the body has ascended through all seven, through all the lower seven uh, spheroth to the highest sphera, which is the seventh month or the seventh part suf. At this point, the body has reached the highest state of consciousness. Now, the Ark was inundated and tossed to and fro by the raging waters. Kabbalistically, mysteriously, the waters represent the vanities, the materialism, the ego, all of the negative aspects of our reality that dumb down, that retard spiritual ascension. And now that the ark has overcome the flood, now that the, that the body, that man has overcome the ego, materialism, vanity, the vanities of the world, the evil inclination, now it can be said that it now truly rests on the seventh part soup. It has reached the highest state of consciousness, of spirituality. Again, this is very deep stuff here. I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom of Elohim here. Now, one of my favorite verses that evinces all of this in a very, in a very Kabbalistic manner is found, as I'm always saying, is in our most esoteric, the most Jewish, the most ancient Jewish esoteric Kabbalistic book of the entire Bible. Literally, the paragon of a true esoteric Kabbalistic treatise and text, which is the Apocalypse. In chapter 5, in verse 1, we read, And I saw upon the right hand of him who was sitting upon the throne a scroll, or a book, written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Now, Yohanan here, what is he seeing? Who is he seeing? If you're initiated, you know that he is having a vision of Hamashiach. It is Hamashiach who is sitting on his throne. Now, this is a very, very Kabbalistic mystical verse. In fact, almost every verse in this book is super Kabbalistic in, in every respect. Now, do we know that he sees a book inside and on the back side of Hamashiach's body. Now, do we note that he is seeing Hamashiach sitting down? Hamashiach is in a sitting down posture or position in this vision. And within his body, and here we can say that the, that the within and the back includes the entire upper body from the torso to the head. He sees a book. And it is sealed with seven seals. So what is he seeing? He is seeing what can only be described as a very supernatural holographic image or vision. We cannot properly explain this in, in human language because it's a type of vision that transcends human language and experience. But we will, I will do my best to explain to you here 
the profound mysticism within this verse. The seven seals he sees are with inside Mashiach's body. Again, we are speaking of the upper torso up to the head. So we're talking two thirds of Mashiach's body being or possessing seven seals within. And these seven seals are the lower seven sefirot, the lower seven partufim of Hamashiach, representing the lower seven states of consciousness and spirituality of Hamashiach. So now we need to ask, who is the book? What does the book represent? To the, answer this question, well, before I answer the question, I, I wanted to include here a diagram of, of what we are what we are speaking of here, right? So here I have what is known to be a very Near Eastern pictorial of the low, of the lower seven sefirot of the body. In Near Eastern theosophies, they are called chakras, and they teach that the spiritual existence of of man is composed of these seven chakras, which is is just the same thing that I have been speaking up to this point, which are the lower seven sefirot or parts of theme. And Yohanan here, when he sees Mashiach, this is what he is seeing. He is seeing these seven chakras or sferoth within Mashiach, which are, are in ancient Hebrew Kabbalistic language known as seven seals. Seven seals is a, a very esoteric Kabbalistic uh, code word uh, for these uh, seven parts of theme uh, or uh, sferoth, because they're these, the sferoth are the parts of theme in very, in very primordial and very ancient in the very ancient holy mysteries, as was known by the ancient Hebrews, going back to Moshe, Eliyahu, etc., they didn't exactly call um, the the chakras. They didn't call them sferoth, or they didn't call them parts of theme. They would have called them seals. They're seals, and it's a very fitting term because the whole purpose of our existence is to unseal these seals. When we are born, these seven seals are exactly that. They are sealed. The whole purpose of spiritual ascension, of spiritual growth, is to unseal these seals, these spiritual seals. Now, let us go. Now, the Hebrew word, uh, or the, the 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 word chakra, uh, is actually Sanskrit for wheel or disc. Okay. Now, the two most ancient languages on planet Earth, as far as I'm concerned, and as far as many are concerned, are Sanskrit and Hebrew, and um, well, I don't want to get into it, but the point is that chakra is a Sanskrit for wheel or disc, which is interesting because the sferoth is actually an ancient Hebrew word for a sphere or a circle, right? So we see that similar words in the ancient languages were being used to describe uh, these very holy mysteries, right? So that's of 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 great interest that's a very interesting note i guess to, to to add to this now going back uh to the question i proposed who is this book we have to go back to our most ancient most initiated grandmaster kabbalist and holy saint on record from the second temple period which is none other than philon Judeus. now we read in Sefer Bereshit in chapter 2 verse 4 it states this book is that of the origin of the heavens and the earth when it came into being now, this verse is taken from the Septuagint because this verse is a perfect example demonstrating at times the inferiority of our Hebrew Masorah because the Hebrew Masorah has been corrupted in that the two, word, the two Hebrew words, Zesefer, which is this book, are not found in our Hebrew Masoretic texts. And this is because the Hebrew Masoretic text is partially corrupted, as I've stated in other videos. We don't have the 100% full, unadulterated, uh, holy word as it existed, say, in the time of Moshe or Eliyahu. It's been partially corrupted by Hasatan. And one perfect example of this is when you cross-reference the superior Septuagint. In this case, we learn that this very critical, most critical uh, two words this book are not found in the Hebrew Masoretic text. 
Now, I cannot ex even begin to explain to you the, impl in the implications and the ramifications of how the universe is altered when the Torah becomes corrupted or perverted, which I assure you it has. Now, very, very Kabbalistically, this is a very extremely advanced Kabbalistic passage that I'm now going to read to you uh, from his first treatise entitled Allegorical Interpretation, Treatise 1. He states, uh, commenting on this verse, he states, that is to say, this perfect reason, now, the word reason here is is the Greek is the Greek word logo. So you have to understand that, the, that this is an English translation of, of an underlying ancient Greek text. The underlying Greek word there for reason is logos, which is the divine word. And we know who the divine word is, that that's Hamashiach. So what he's saying here is that is to say that this perfect logos moving in accord with the number seven is the primal origin, both of mind ordering itself after the original patterns or images and of sense perception in the domain of mind. If the expression is permissible, ordering itself after those originals or images book, that is the Hebrew word sefer in this verse is Moshe's name for the logos of Elohim in which have been inscribed and engraved the formation of all else, but that you may not suppose that the deity makes anything in definite periods of time, but may know that to mortal kind, the process of creation is unobserved, undescribed, inca incomprehensible. He adds, when it came to be, when it came into being, not defining when by a determining limit for the things that come into being under the hand of the first cause, come into being with no determining limit, there is an end then of the notion that the universe came into being in six days. Perfectly well stated. This Grandmaster Kabbalist was of the highest order. The text speaks for itself. If you have a high IQ and a high SQ, you more than understand what has been brilliantly elucidated and illuminated in this folio. Now, the key point here is that the Hebrew word sefer, which is the Hebrew word for book or scroll, it's a Kabbalistic code word with many esoteric levels to it. Here, he gives us one of those esoteric keys. Book, then, is mystically representing the logos, Hamashiach. He is the Aleph Tau. He spans the entire Aleph Beth because he contains all of the divine code. This book, this scroll, has inscribed upon it all of the divine code, the divine code that is behind the entire construct and its units and its parts. So when Yohanan states that he saw a book with seven seals on it, you should know that the book he's referring to is Hamashiach. The book is seated upon the throne. The book, the Sefer, is Hamashiach. And it is composed of seven seals. These are the lower seven parts of theme of Hamashiach. Or what the or what the partially initiated Near Eastern peoples and the Goyim who have been initiated into those inferior theosophies would call the chakras. Now, again. One of the main purposes of our spiritual existence is to ascend these chakras or spheroth. And this is where the inferiority of all theosophies comes into play because being the chosen, the true chosen and elect and elite of Ha Elohim, of Alohe Israel, we are the only ones, we are the only people, our esoteric holy order the highest holiest order that exists on this planet, we are the only ones that have the keys that know how to truly ascend all seven levels, all seven chakras, how to do so properly. Because there are two ways, there are two principal paths to ascend these seven spheroth. Because there are two serpents. There are what they would call two kundalinis, 
right? The Kundalini is the serpent. There are two serpents, as I'm always, as I'm, I've been always teaching and revealing. Practically, all of the goyim, irregardless of their origin, they all ascend. If they do ascend, if they happen to get to a state of ascension, their path and key to ascension is the evil serpent, the evil Kundalini. This is Lucifer. Lucifer is is everywhere and he he's very willing he willingly easily will give anyone the key to ascend through his methods to his through his uh, through his ways which are forbidden and verboten contrary to the torah contrary to the highest counsel of the Elohim. the other way is through hamashiach but you have to know who hamashiach is and you have to have a very close, special, very intimate relationship with him and his bride, Shekhinah. And those that can truly say that are very few in number in this last generation. So I hope that you have learned a lot through this presentation. And I hope that this video will propel you to begin to ascend uh, the higher spiritual levels of consciousness. Shalom, we amen.